Okay, and I've just posted two links in the chat. If you're interested in CME credits for this presentation, you can click on the first one to get and sign up for your CME credits and the second one to see our disclosure form. But I will give it to Dr. K for a little introduction. Super, yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, do sign up uh, for CME, it is uh, free. And we certainly do offer CME for our, our lectures and uh, please do so. Um, I have the uh, privilege of um, welcoming Dr. Chaya Prasad, uh, who's going to give us a wonderful talk uh, today on harassment and, uh, and abuse in medical education. Uh, Dr. Chaya Prasad uh, hails from Bangalore, India, where she, she received her MD degree. She wanted, went on to complete uh, pathology, um, <clears throat> her pathology residency at OHSU, followed by her gynecologic and perinatal pathology fellowship at Harvard University. During this period, she participated in several NIH grants, including Physician Scientist Award. Um, she went on uh, with a long, having a long career at Kaiser Permanente, where she uh, wore many administrative hats and obtained her MBA. Um, Dr. Prasad moved to Western University of Health Sciences in 2016, where she's a professor and chair of the Clinical Sciences Department. And she's uh, passionate about combating sexual abuse in the medical profession and encouraging students to get themselves involved in identifying um, a solution to the existing uh, reported, uh, to the existing reporting processes. Um, Dr. Bersaud firmly believes that a process of education awareness will provide solutions for the pandemic of sexual abuse uh, that prevails in the medical profession. Her students and her passion for this topic has uh, garnered the research grant of close to a half a million dollars in 2021. So congratulations, Dr. Prasad, on that. And thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Mike. Um, I want to thank Alexa first before I forget for her patience in putting up with my delayed responses. Thank you, Alexa. And uh, thank you to Dr. Katsaris, uh, Dr. Pekia, and the team for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to share some of the work that we're doing. So um, as uh, Dr. Katsaris said, I'm Dr. Prasad. I'm a professor at the Western University of Health Sciences in sunny Southern California, though it's not very sunny this morning. It's really cloudy this morning. Not sure what's happening with the world. But um, uh, today I want to talk about Project SHAME. So SHAME stands for Sexual Harassment and Abuse in the Medical Education. Uh, this project was started uh, by three medical students who were second year medical students at that time and myself. And the students have since then graduated. They just graduated in 2021. They are currently PGY1 residents at different universities, different specialties. Uh, KB is uh, MedPeds uh, specialty. Matt Zeller is in surgery. Matt LaPlante is the ER physician now. So as you can imagine, they are very, very busy. They started their residencies just six months ago. And though they cannot be here in person for the presentation, uh, they are very much here with us in spirit today. They are very, very passionate students about this, particularly about this uh, topic. So it's my pleasure to have worked with them. So at the time of the study three years ago, this is one of my disclaimer, uh, disclaimer studies, so uh, slides. So at that time, we did not have any funding or support, but in 2021, we did get a sizable grant from Family Cares Foundation, close to $500,000. I think it's like 460 plus something, 460,000 plus something. Uh, we have no disclaimers other than this. We strongly, and I repeat strongly, encourage all participants to seek psychological help if listening to this presentation resurfaces any psychological trauma. And this is really very critical. So please keep this in mind. If this topic uh, resurfaces any trauma, do move away from this top, uh, from this presentation. And that is totally understandable. So I want to give a little bit of a background first, and uh, a lot of the information that I'm going to talk about will pertain to the United States of America. And I know this is a global conference, but I do have a little bit of data uh, pertaining to the global incidence of uh, sexual 
abuse in the medical education. Uh, there is a 2020 article, it is, in, it is in one of the references that I have in the end of the presentation. The interesting thing is the uh, incidence mirrors very closely what's happening in the United States. Uh, that's number one uh, comparison. And number two is that uh, not much has changed with violence. Um, uh, uh, of sexual abuse, the medical education and medical profession globally as it is in the United States. So that's another similarity. The only thing that differs is the incidence of reporting. So we'll come to that in a minute. So uh, a little bit of the background. Title IX was passed in US in 1972. And I'm going to repeat this verbatim at this point. 2017, it states, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So that's exactly how it's stated in, it was stated in 2017. So this protects both male and female uh, students and employees against sexual misconduct and sexual abuse in educational settings. It requires every school district to have at least one person designated as the Title IX coordinator. So all medical schools, all universities now are following suit. In fact, we just hired our Title IX uh, director last year at the Western University. Title IX interestingly enough, also applies, most people don't know this, but it also applies to hospitals and clinical practices, such as clinics and small non-hospital uh, settings that engage in resident training programs. So if you have a resident rotating in your institution or in your clinic, Title IX applies to this uh, setting. So something to keep in mind. Uh, I want to cover some basics here again. There's a lot of some confusion about uh, uh, terminology, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we use the right terminology as defined by the World Health Organization and the National Sexual Violence uh, Resource Center. So these are some of the words that we will be using. So SM is sexual misconduct. It uses power, control, and or intimidation to harm others. Sexual harassment, SH, is defined as the unwelcome conduct of sexual nature, including unwelcome sexual advances, uh, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal, nonverbal, or physical conduct of a sexual nature. Sexual abuse is defined as non-consensual sexual conduct, uh, contact, and non-consensual sexual intercourse. So we wanted to, we will be using, I'll be using these terms moving forward in the presentation. And these are the definitions. So uh, just to give you the uh, significance of this topic and the sensitivity of this topic, it's interesting that in 2019, Bloomberg had this article on their front page and uh, on their cover. And the title reads, America's medical profession has a sexual harassment problem. The power wielded by instructors and the high stakes faced by students creates an environment where misconduct flourishes. So this is exactly how it was titled. So if you look at that picture, it shows a female student trying to climb up, up a flight of stairs, but the bottom part is crumbling and she's struggling to stay steady. Perhaps she's even trying to climb further up to keep herself safe. But you see a male faculty or a preceptor or a colleague who's either stopping her or, he, or he's blocking her. The female student looks scared and she's, she looks worried as she looks behind her with apprehension. Now, if you look above uh, this one preceptor on the top, you see there are other individuals, again, could be colleagues, professors, preceptors, who are silent witnesses. They're not doing anything to help her. So this image is rather poignant and it emphasizes the very harsh journey that medical students, female medical students, residents and fellows face during the education journey. Now the journey itself is harsh given the academic component, right? But then you add this component of sexual harassment and it can be a very nightmarish experience for the female residents. So looking at the background to uh, sexual uh, misconduct in medicine. Now keep in mind, women make up almost 80% of the healthcare workforce with an estimate of about 50% of female medical students experiencing sexual harassment even before they're graduating. So that is kind of a horrific number. Uh, females definitely face more sexual harassment than do their male counterparts. 
Uh, the numbers that I'm going to give you are a little bit staggering right now. Female medical students are at 220% more likely to experience sexual harassment, 149% more likely to face sexual misconduct than their non-SEM female majors. So SEM is science, engineering, and medicine, right? So these numbers are staggering, 220% more likely and 149% more likely. The perpetrators of sexual harassment differ. Some of the articles cite the peers as the major perpetrators. Some articles cite superiors like the preceptors or the faculty. The sad part of this data is that this culture persists all through medical education and can even extend, it's not a matter of it can, it does extend into the female physician's professional career. The problem with all the studies that we looked at is that it has included both undergraduates, medical students, and residents, and has clumped them all. That's a major limitation because we don't have data pertaining just to medical students in the, who experienced this during the medical education. So that was one of the things that we were concerned about. Now, as I mentioned, sexual uh, misconduct in international medical schools has been described, but again, the, the data is rather sparse. But the numbers are very, very similar to what's happening in the United States. In 2019, uh, NAS, National Academy of Sciences, reported, again, verbatim, disturbingly high rates of harassment in medical school for men and women, 20 to 50. 50% of female students said they had experienced uh, 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 sexually harassing behaviors perpetrated by faculty and or staff. 50% of female medical students at Penn State University again repeat, repeated, uh, reported the same. Again, the number is close to 50%. Another study at the University of Texas, 47% of female medical students said they had been harassed. These are just a few examples that were cited in the 2019 uh, NAS report. So a little bit about the Me Too, hashtag Me Too movement. Everyone is very familiar with this. I uh, want to give some credit to Tarana Burke. She is a survivor and an activist. She started this movement in 2006, really did not hit, uh, hit the national media, did not hit the social media until 2017, where there were serious uh, allegations against Hollywood personalities. Trust Hollywood to bring everything out into the open world, right? So because of the allegations against Hollywood personalities, the hashtag MeToo movement took off. So to give you an example, there's an actress by the name of Alyssa Milano. I vaguely remember seeing her in some, she was a little kid in some shows, TV shows, but I don't remember much of her. She's very famous. Anyway, she took to social media in 2017 and asked for all survivors to respond with the words, hashtag Me Too. In 24 hours, in, in just within a day, 4.7 million survivors responded on social media to her request. That's how prevalent this uh, unfortunate uh, topic is. So following this on the educational front, nine University of California uh, campuses enrolled in the hashtag MeToo movement. Uh, this included UC Irvine, Berkeley, UCLA, USC, Davis, and so on. This then moved to the financial arena. Silicon Valley, of course, is the hub of uh, the finance, uh, the financial platform in this country. Apple, Google, Facebook all jumped in and uh, adopted the hashtag MeToo movement. It then went to politics, sports, and music, and finally, finally made its way into medicine. So the uh, MeToo bill was introduced in Congress uh, by Representative Jackie Speier. It was passed in 2018. Uh, we also have the hashtag Times Up Healthcare. This was started in 2019 in response to the Hollywood scandals. Again, Hollywood, right? Hollywood scandals with Harvey Goldstein. And the interesting thing the, is that with the hashtag Times Up Healthcare movement, it was based on the fact, again, I've given you this number before, 80% of healthcare workforce is female in this country, but only 20% of the females are in the leadership role. And to change that, this movement was started. And again, very powerful with, her, with Hollywood backing you up, uh, the organization in just one year raised $24 million. So that's how powerful this was. So this is a little bit background about the hashtag MeToo movement. This is a rather painful slide. Um, and again, I'm only uh, referring to incidents uh, that happened on the West Coast of America. If I were to include data from across the country and globally, 
I would need several more slides. And again, I mentioned these not to point fingers at any institution, but just to give you an uh, example of the, uh, to demonstrate the enormity of this topic. Uh, OHSU uh, pains me to discuss OHSU. I did my residency there, absolutely loved my time there, was the best time of my career, in fact. Uh, again, when you look at what happened in 2018, sexual allegations, against faculty and staff in cardiology, lawsuit is still pending, not much in the media in, in 2018, no action was taken. So it continued. Then in 2018, a medicine resident files a lawsuit, not much in the media, no action taken, they ignored it. 2020, right at the start of the pandemic, I have no problem mentioning this name because this name is very much out in the social media. Dr. Campbell, an ER resident, he and his team put together a TikTok dance. In fact, he's known as the TikTok doc. Um, you can look it up anytime. And it's a very uh, uh, motivating uh, TikTok uh, video. But uh, during the peak pandemic, it showed the positive attitude of the residents in the ER. Very nice uh, video. But unfortunately, at the same time, he was hailed as a hero by the whole world. In fact, he was on CNN. He was on MSNBC, all the top uh, news medias. But however, behind the scenes, there were some serious allegations of sexual misconduct against Dr. Campbell. Now, one of the professors who's internationally known uh, for her work on sexual abuse in the medical profession uh, was the, the incident was alleged incidents were, alleged, were, uh, actually were uh, uh, brought to her attention, but she and the senior leaders chose to look the other way. They did not follow the policy that they themselves had created and had published extensively about. Uh, finally, in 2020, the lawsuit was file, uh, filed. Dr. Campbell was transferred very quietly to a residency program in Florida, and then it went uh, national. So the case was settled for several hundreds of thousands of dollars. Dr. Campbell was fired from his residency. As of now, whereabouts are known and all the leadership at OHSU are under uh, investigation. So in 2021, another uh, anesthesiologist was uh, accused, and that's an ongoing investigation. USC, Dr. Verma was named as the uh, Dean of the Medical School in 2019, despite ongoing allegations of uh, abuse against medical students and researchers. Uh, the theory is that he had just received an $11 million NIH grant, and perhaps because of that, USC decided to look the other way. Who knows? A year later, he resigned. 2021, um, uh, USC again. Uh, I think everyone is very familiar with the, the next two 710 women sued uh, USC gynecologist. The largest settlement, $1.1 billion in the history of US, was, set, uh, was uh, agreed upon. UCLA, another gynecologist involving 5,500 women. I mean, it's horrific when you look at these numbers. $73 million settlement, and then the doctor was, uh, he re resigned. So again, no allegations against any uh, institutions, just giving you some data. All right. Um... So what happens post medical school training? So, so far I've given you some numbers with reference to medical school. So let's look at what happens post. Uh, the first article, the first few articles that I've uh, referenced on the top uh, refer to an article, uh, a study that looked at uh, GI uh, uh, internal medicine and pediatric uh, residents. The goal of the study was to look at the reasons for lack of reporting by the victims. Uh, the next two articles Locke talked about uh, sexual misconduct in medical practicing and practicing physicians, that is. And it was interesting that they concluded that, of course, as you would expect, women are affected more often. And they correlated this with uh, a sequelae of poor mental health, lack of career development, increased burnout, increased incidence of suicidality, and uh, 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 burnout in female physicians. But the bottom line is there are very few studies or even actually zero studies looking at the incidence uh, of sexual misconduct in the medical uh, education period. So just to give you a little bit of an example of that one uh, study that looked at uh, the residency program, this is from the University of Louisville, Kentucky from 2020. Uh, they sent the survey to 271 program directors. You would expect several thousand students to have uh, residents to have responded, right? Total respondents was only 381 student, uh, residents who responded. Um, 
And of course, they looked at both PGY1, 2, and 3 residents. Uh, again, summary, and I show this only because every time I have presented this uh, uh, talk at national meetings, the one question that is always asked of me is, what constitutes sexual harassment? So one gentleman asked me, he said, you know, I have an elderly female patient. I've known her for decades. She's almost like a family member. She gets me Christmas cookies every year. And at the end of the visit, I hug her. Is that considered sexual harassment? So I always include the slide. And I want to quickly look at what constitutes sexual harassment. Again, keep in mind, this article is from 2020, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. So the first four are the most common ones, offensive and or suggestive comments and jokes, being called by derogative language regarding sexual orientation, being shown sexually suggestive or inappropriate images, having someone flash or expose themselves to you. So those four are the most common. The others include unwanted attention, inappropriate starting, pressure for sexual acts, inappropriate or unwanted invitations for dates, sexual acts in exchange for advancement, unwanted physical appropriate patients in body language. So something to keep in mind for all of us. Some may sound rather innocuous, but if it is unwanted, it falls into the category of sexual uh, harassment. So coming back to the same article, looking at residency programs, uh, they concluded that 82% of the vic victims were females versus 44% being males. The most common form of sexual harassment was offensive and suggestive jokes and comments. 99% um, of the perpetrators in the case of female victims were males, that you would expect, and superiors were at 60%. With males, it was equally uh, distributed between males and females as perpetrators, but only 30% of them were superiors. Uh, they were the perpetrators with men. Uh, patient perpetrators, also keep in mind, we're always talking about our colleagues and our superiors. You have to also pay attention to patients being the perpetrators of sexual harassment. Uh, amongst uh, male students was 45%, female students was much higher at 69.7%, almost 70%, almost double. Uh, the key thing is the last statement. The majority of participants who had experienced some kind of harassment during medical school and residency, and this number was as high as 55.8% in females and 35.6% in males. So pretty high medical school and residency. So uh, this slide talks about sexual harassment in uh, medical professions. So we're now looking at practicing physicians. We looked at medical students, we looked at uh, residents and fellows, we're now looking at practicing physicians. This is an article from 2019 NIH article, Louisiana University. They again confirmed the high rates of burnout in female physicians, and they correlated it to the increased incidence of uh, sexual uh, harassment in female physicians. The Harvard Business Review article from 2018, the one that I'll be coming back to in a few minutes, talks about institutional policies and procedures when it comes to handling of uh, these reports and how to stop sexual harassment in the medical profession. It's an absolutely brilliant article. But again, it's it, it comes from uh, OHSU and I wish, yeah, never mind. Anyway, uh, you have to walk the talk. That's something that you have to keep in mind. Uh, the Bloomberg article that I already referred to also talked about pra practicing physicians. Uh, the good thing is with all these articles making it to, into the uh, national uh, media, AAMC, which is the Association of American Medical Colleges, they took a very major step and started an initiative to address sexual harassment in the medical profession. And you need the backup of these very powerful uh, organizations. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the fear of retribution in the medical profession. Dr. Jack C, she's gonna be one of our speakers in the upcoming CME that I will be hosting uh, come March of this uh, year. Uh, she's a really well-known figure hailing from uh, Michigan State University. She's uh, nationally and internationally known for her work with uh, sexual harassment in the medical profession. And um, I included this slide to demonstrate the very difficult journey that a victim, a female victim faces when she is uh, harassed. So she talks about one of her own colleagues, a, a physician who had been assaulted at work. So this physician goes to her lawyer and says, hey, I want to file a case. And this lawyer who's another female 
a female attorney tells her point blank, she says, if you know what's good for you, don't do it. I mean, that's how bad it is. Uh, she goes on to say that victims are frozen out of promotions, they are blocked from moving to different jobs and rotations, they're often given bad recommendations, they face uh, pay differences, they get no salary raises or bonuses, they are shunned by their peers and seniors, and the list goes on. And as a result, the sequelae, emotional and mental stress, impaired finances, um, everything hits home on the personal front with impaired uh, family dynamics, and unfortunately, this starts in the medical school and goes on into the practicing physician's lives. So something that we really have to keep in mind. So today's reality, 2019, uh, article from New England Journal of Medicine. Again, I'm gonna read this uh, out. Imagine a medical school dean addressing the incoming class with this demoralizing prediction. So this is what the dean says. Look at the woman to your left, then look at the woman to your right. On average, one of them will be sexually harassed during the next four years, even before she has begun her career as a physician. That's how daunting the data looks and something has to change. So this was kind of the basis, all the data that I've given you was the basis of our research. Uh, 2019 was particularly significant because it was the first time uh, women comprise the majority of medical students in the United States. And as a result, there is a dire, dire need for the development of policies and interventions of sexual violence. There's a major gap in the published literature surrounding sexual misconduct in medical schools. There is a need for data regarding the true prevalence of this uh, disease in medical education. Now, Title IX has encouraged all the institutions to establish policies and training. That's wonderful but the culture has to change and the consequences have to be implemented. And that's what is lacking at this point in time in our country. Uh, now, the prior research also showed that the behavior in medical school leads to increased risk of uh, medical board sanctions as a physician. It is critical to acknowledge that medical schools are the appropriate time and the place to address this inappropriate sexual behavior, we have to hold individuals responsible and have to have them face consequences. So with all this in mind, we established our study and these are the things that we wanted to really address. We wanted to look at the prevalence. We wanted to uh, see the differentiation based on gender, the relationship of perpetrators to, of uh, sexual violence to the student, uh, determine the effects of sexual violence on a student's education, identify reporting rates, and also identifying uh, uh, barriers to reporting in uh, medical schools in this country. So we started with obtaining an IRB. IRB is the Institutional Review Board. Uh, this was a multi-institutional uh, study involving uh, 14 uh, different medical schools across the country. Uh, we had a cross-sectional electronic survey. It was sent out to uh, it was actually sent out from the student uh, government presidents to eligible student bodies. So this was really primarily run by students. Um, submission of the survey by the students implied uh, informed consent. Um, eligibility criteria included um, uh, enrollment in an osteopathic medical school uh, during the years 2018, academic year 2018, 2019. Um, attendance at an institution where the dean had uh, given us a return support for the students' participation. Uh, participants could stop at any time and no data would be collected. They could choose not to answer every question, but they could still complete the survey. And as I mentioned very early in the beginning, students were strongly encouraged to seek help um, if answering questions resurfaced any trauma. We really wanted to be very careful. Um, uh, there are no validated surveys of, uh, regarding sexual violence in medical education, so we had to develop our own survey. Uh, we had a biostatistician review the survey questions and validate them for us. We also provided students with the basic definitions of sexual harassment and abuse, as I mentioned earlier on in the slide, as uh, detailed by uh, WHO and Title IX. Uh, we wanted some degree of standardization, so that was key for us. Uh, the survey contained a minimum of 10 questions and a maximum of 23 questions, depending on the participants' responses. Uh, we clearly maintained anonymity with reference to the students and also uh, their ties to the universities. We did not want to target one university uh, and, uh, or a different university. So we kept all that information anonymous. Uh, we classified medical school education into preclinical or didactic, which is the same, which is years one and two, 
and the clinical years were years three and four. This is the flow chart that shows some of the basic demographic questions in the survey, uh, the medical school they were attending, gender, level of education, whether they had experienced uh, sexual abuse or harassment, if they had any knowledge or satisfaction with the medical school policies, because that's something so simple. You'd think every medical student who walks into the school would know what the policies are, right? But you'd be surprised majority of students have no idea what the policy is. They have no idea who to reach out to. They are clueless. So the, we, we definitely wanted to know. We wanted to confirm these uh, hypotheses. Um, we also had some additional questions. If they had experienced sexual abuse, uh, what was the number of uh, perpetrators? How many incidents? Uh, type of perpetrator, relationship to the perpetrator, the reporting status, and if they did not report it, what was the reason for not reporting? Uh, this is a pretty standard slide. Uh, this is how we maintain the anonymity of our respondents. We definitely took a lot of uh, pains to make sure that all the data was uh, de-identified. I'm not even going to pretend I understand the slide. This is about uh, statistics. This was put together by a biostatistician and one of our students was very good at stats. If it's okay with you, I'm going to skip the slide. If you have a penchant for uh, statistics, look at it in depth, but please don't ask me questions. Full disclosure, uh, study results, let's see what we found. So we sent the survey out to 14 osteopathic <clears throat> medical schools across the country, where the deans had already provided a letter of support for the project. 11,118 students received the survey, 14.56%, which is 1,619 students responded to the survey. Uh, responses were kind of geographically diverse, including data from 15 states, included most of the major US regions. The highest number of responses came from one institution. 13% of all responses came from this institution. And I have a feeling that it's probably our university, but I, again, I cannot guarantee that. And it, as you can see, the majority of the responses for whatever strange reason came from the West Coast and the Southwest. Uh, some of the key demographics, 54% of females uh, responded to the survey, whereas 44% of males responded. Uh, almost 60% of the students were in the didactic phase, uh, that is years one and two, while 40% were in the clinical education phase, the clinical years. It's a rather busy slide, but uh, just to give you some highlights, uh, this looks at the demographics and the prevalence uh, of sexual misconduct and harassment. 17% of all incidents were sexual misconduct, 12% were sexual harassment. And when you look at the gender prevalence, 25% of females experienced sexual misconduct, 19% experienced sexual harassment. Now, these numbers, when you look at uh, for females, was 25 and 19, right? For males, it was much lower, 7% and 4%. So considerable difference in the numbers between males and females. So females are at a much higher risk of facing both sexual misconduct and harassment when it comes to their male counterparts. Uh, this is kind of a hard hitting slide and clearly tells you there's a significant gender, gender difference in terms of whether the respondent experienced uh, sexual misconduct. One in every seven student experienced sexual abuse and or harassment. Majority of them were women. So again, one in seven. So let's look at this a little bit closer. Um, one of the questions, again, very important to us was the type of perpetrators. The majority of the perpetrators were students at 52%. Preceptors, 19% came next on the list. Faculty were at 12%. Uh, the category of other was 11%. And in 6% of cases, the students chose not to disclose who, the, who their perpetrators were. The category of other we concluded could potentially include patients, staff, and or administrators. So we don't know exactly that category of other, what it constitutes. Uh, gender significantly affected whether the respondent affected uh, sexual misconduct with both males and females responding, uh, reporting it, um, but uh, female, females reported uh, students as the perpetrators at a much higher rate than males. So here is that slide. It's a little busy, 
but I'm going to quickly uh, go into the perpetrator status here. The black bar is sexual misconduct, dark is sexual harassment, light gray is sexual abuse, and this is true for tables A, B, C, and D. Uh, table A looks at the perpetrator status as reported by both males and females. Table B is females as reported by females. Table C is perpetrator status as reported by males. And table D is the perpetrator status as reported in the didactic versus the clinical years of training. So in table A, you can see that male students reported uh, students as being the most common type of perpetrator. And this is true in, uh, I'm sorry, in table B and C, both males and female students reported students as being the most common uh, perpetrator. Now, table D is uh, interesting because it clearly demonstrates that sexual abuse is more prevalent during the didactic years than it is in the clinical years. And again, even in the didactic years, it was the students who were the most common perpetrators. So I'm, I'm sure Alexa will give you access to the slides. Please do feel free to look at this uh, rather busy slide in more detail. So to summarize our findings, medical students were the most common perpetrators at 51%. Uh, preceptors, faculty, and others were at 19%, 11%, and 11% respectively. Uh, students were the most common perpetrators during the didactic years at 80%. Preceptors were the most common perpetrators during the clinical education at 33%. The number of perpetrators was not dependent on gender, nor was it dependent on the point of education for sexual abuse. However, the number of perpetrators was dependent on the point in medical education for sexual harassment. So for abuse, it was not, but for sexual harassment, the number of uh, perpetrators was dependent on the point of education. Um, so I think, oh. so we then uh, divided the, uh, the, we wanted to look at uh, further depth about the perpetrators. So we divided them into two categories. Uh, we, had, we looked at gender and in point of education. Male and female students reported students as the most common uh, perpetrators of both sexual harassment and abuse. Females reported students as perpetrators at much higher rates than their male counterpart. When it came to the point of education, students were again the most common perpetrators of sexual misconduct during didactic education and preceptors were the most common during the clinical education. And again, I've given you the percentages uh, in parentheses. The next thing we looked at was reporting again, very important, right? Uh, and we wanted to look at the incidence of reporting and in the cases where students did not report, we wanted to see the reasons why they did not report. So 80% of students who experienced 80, 80%, 80 that's pretty high who experienced sexual uh, abuse and harassment did not report at all. 64% of all, both male and female respondents were satisfied with the institution's policies on sexual harassment and abuse. However, those who were victims had significantly different levels of satisfaction. So let's look at that a little bit closely. 31% of those who experienced harassment were dissatisfied with the institution policy, as you would imagine. 25.5% who uh, experienced sexual abuse also said that they were dissatisfied. And a deeper dive showed that males students reported higher satisfaction rates with the policies than their female counterparts did. Again, something that you would expect. And the details of the numbers are still there. So we then looked at uh, the non-responders and we said, okay, why did you not respond? And this is the reasons that they gave us. They were primarily worried about being accused of overreacting. Other reasons included no action. They felt that no action would be taken, that they would gain a negative reputation. They would face a negative influence, uh, that this would uh, have a negative influence on their career. Fear of not being believed, retaliation by the perpetrator, lack of support from the school, retaliation by the school, and the list goes on. But these were the top contenders for reasons for not reporting. So many reasons, unfortunately. And remember, 80% did not report. So again, just to highlight, 80% did not report. Again, number one being, reason being, fear of being accused of overreacting. Number two, no action would be taken. Number three, fear of negative influence on their career. Number four, non-specified. 
we then asked this question, what was the impact of uh, this sexual misconduct on your educational path? 68% of uh, females who experienced sexual harassment reported that it interfered with their education. 85% who experienced sexual abuse reported that it interfered with their uh, education. Now, these numbers are very high. First and foremost, they're very high. And we as faculty in a teaching institution, we should be prioritizing on making the educational environment one of safety and one of a nurturing environment, not one of fear. It really looks like we have failed our students. So these numbers are very disturbing at so many different levels. So we went on to ask more questions and we said, what was the impact on not only on your education, but also on admission? What are your thoughts? What do you think should change? So 57% of students who experienced harassment indicated that it interfered with the academic uh, educate, uh, performance in medical school, right? With almost 10% claiming that it interfered significantly. That's 10% of students claimed that it interfered significantly with their educational uh, uh, pathway. 68% uh, who experienced uh, uh, abuse also said that it interfered with their performance with 12% saying it interfered significantly. Now the numbers are climbing up from 10%, it's gone up to 12%. Uh, females, of course, uh, reported higher le levels of interference than males. Uh, majority of the students indicated the desire for a history of sexual misconduct offense to be reported on medical school applications. And I'm saying this very slowly because this is something that is so important and hopefully, hopefully in the future, this sh should happen. Having these offenses being reported on medical school applications might make a world of difference. Uh, of course, females wanted this change more than males uh, because women are more uh, victims than uh, men. And uh, I'll, I'll get to this a little bit later when we talk about some of the changes that need to happen in the educational process. So survey, finally, uh, looking at the, uh, uh, as a conclusion of our, of our study, uh, we are one of the largest, uh, I think it is the largest study that looked at the prevalence of sexual violence in osteopathic medical schools across the country. We looked at the reporting rates, perpetrate, perpetrator status, reporting barriers, attitudes towards reporting sexual misconduct on medical school applications. And we showed that our respondents are clearly affected by the abuse in medical school education. Women are more affected than men and students were the primary offenders and the barriers included uh, things like no action would be taken, fear of negative influence and so on. So what were some of the lessons that we learned? So the top perpetrators, the number one that thing that we understood was top perpetrators were medical students. Now this aligns with previous knowledge from other studies where sexual misconduct is perpetrated by people whom the victim already knows is not strangers. Uh, lessons here would be to develop proactive interventional st strategies, right? With scrutinizing admission selection. This is what our students told us, especially the women students, female students. Uh, it might be a good idea to have prior Title IX sanction sanctions be reported on applications. Um, now, Title IX has addressed some of these by implementing training programs, either online or in person. But the key thing is look at post-training evaluations, collect data repeatedly to see, to evaluate the effectiveness of the training that medical schools have in place. For example, most medical schools have one mandatory um, sexual abuse training at the start of medical school, one, and then the topic is dropped. No further education, no further monitoring, nothing is done during the four years. So things need to change. Uh, medicine has been uh, described as a culture uh, where uh, sexual misconduct is prevalent and it's also notorious for not holding the perpetrators accountable. We saw this with all the data from the West Coast, right? So this creates fear surrounding the potential outcome of reporting sexual misconduct. That culture has to change. Remove the barriers of fear. Focus should not be place, uh, placed on increasing awareness of existing policies, but really on improving the policies themselves and above all, holding the perpetrators accountable. Uh, medical schools are responsible 
for providing a safe and nurturing environment to our students. That is our priority, right? Um, our study definitely had some limitations. It's the, like, like I said, it's the largest to date. Uh, the findings were very remarkable. Uh, we had some standard uh, survey biases, for example, students who had faced uh, misconduct were more likely to respond. Uh, our study included only institutions where the dean had provided approval. Uh, we did not have data pertaining to allopathic medical students, so we did have our limitations. This is uh, a very important slide. I'm almost coming to the tail end of my study uh, of my presentation, so I want to give a little bit of emphasis to this. So this is from 2019, again, Harvard Business Review. I've cited this frequently in the past uh, three, four years. Um, over the one past one year, I, I'm a little uncomfortable referencing it again because the main author is from OHSU who's still under investigation. But if you disregard that fact, the material in this article is very relevant. As long as you adhere to it, you walk the talk. It's not just a policy on paper, but actually there is some uh, tangible action associated with it. So let's look at what the changes that are recommended. So the number one thing is healthcare organizations uh, uh, have to thoroughly and repeatedly measure, again, keep in mind, repeatedly, you have to do this repeatedly during the course of the education, measure the nature, the prevalence and the severity of sexual harassment. You have to create an open reporting process, open reporting process, very, very, every word in this article is so significant. So open reporting process, provide forms, forums where employees can actually share ideas and feel that they are part of this whole process. Tie the compensation of senior leaders to outcomes. You have no idea how significant finances money can be, how powerful money can be. When you tie compensation to outcomes, senior leadership will take decisive action. Uh, they should use the standardized validated instruments to survey their uh, students, employees, et cetera, annually and anonymously. Uh, survey data should have uh, identified, you should identify weaknesses, which is very important, right? But at the same time, come up with the remedies and track progress, track progress, very important. Number two, they should focus on the safety. They should respect uh, inclusion and equality and diversity. It should in, uh, contain guidelines for standards of behavior, institutional responses to these offensive behaviors and have secure methods of reporting. Victims should have ready access to counseling and support. I hate to say this, but OHSU, with that uh, physician incident that hit the national media, OHSU even refused to provide a counseling to that female victim. That's how sad it was. Uh, policy should be paired with clear and consistent action. Again, very simple, walk the talk. HR should be responsible for ensuring that leadership has clearly communicated a zero tolerance policy. Uh, victims will only come forward when they know that they are safe and, that, and they know that their reporting will result in a rapid, thorough and fair investigation. And the perpetrators will be punished no matter what their rank or reputation, very important again. The economic, reputational and uh, human costs of sexual harassment are huge, for example, uh, with USC, UCLA, they did a study and they found out that the replacement of training, the training and replacing of one physician victim runs as high as $1.1 million. Money talks. So when organizations realize how expensive this process is, they will stand up and do the right thing. The last thing is sexual harassment thrives in settings dominated by men. Remember, we talked about women. I think I said it was 20% only were in leadership roles. So it's important to increase the representation of women in leadership roles. Uh, Drexel University has done an amazing job. They have an executive leadership uh, program where they offer uh, leadership fellowship training for women in the schools of medicine, dentistry, public health, pharmacy, and so on. So amazing things are happening all across the country. Uh, so in summary, I'm, I know I'm running a little, a little late. I want to give time for questions. This is again from the Harvard Business Review article. I am not going to take time to read this out, but it's there for you to remember to read through it. Uh, basically, the last couple of lines are very important. We must support and strengthen women physicians. And this is the time to heal ourselves now. 
again, it's about not doing harm as physicians to anyone. We have to support and strengthen our female physicians. Uh, our study was uh, approved by the IRB board. This is the number. Uh, it has been extensively presented all across the country and internationally. Um, uh, I've been an invited speaker at several national and international meetings. Uh, we received the ACOM 2019 Best Poster uh, along with a financial award. We did receive a close to $500,000 grant. Uh, we still have ongoing work. Our, uh, our award, uh, with our award, we have a three-pronged approach. We have a website that has been, oh, I should have given you the uh, link to the website. I'll send it to Alexa. We have a beautiful website that is now functional. Uh, I have the series of CME webinars that will be starting in uh, March of this year. I will send that link to Alexa and hopefully many of you will join us. I also have students involved in ongoing research looking at report, uh, looking at uh, education and awareness of this very sensitive topic. I definitely want to end with acknowledging Dean Crone uh, from the Western University. She was the one who uh, got me involved in this uh, project three years ago. We had no clue what we were doing and uh, I really thank her for that. Uh, Dr. Mark Spiker from ACOM, uh, Olivia Pipitoni from, she's our biostatistician. We couldn't have done anything without her family cares for their support. Some of the references are pertinent references are included. And with that, I want to thank uh, uh, the Global Grand Rounds uh, team, Dr. Katsaris, Dr. Pekia and everyone else. And thank you, Alexa. I'm ready for questions. Thank you so much for such an informative, uh, important, uh, subject and uh, congratulations on your work. I think the contributions will be long lasting in the building. So again, congratulations for your work and to all the students that you uh, brought along with you. Um, I, I just, if I can just start the conversation is, you know, boy, if there's a place that should be safe for students, it should be a medical school, right? I mean, that's something that we, if we purport ourselves to be ones that are promoting health, <laughs> right? So the question is for the, for the bodies that oversee the accreditation of medical schools, COCA and for LC3, et cetera, are they looking at whether the schools are following the recommendations that you put in their conclusion? In other words, are they looking for evidence that a annual survey is going on, that more training is going on, on, not just on entry, but on a regular basis. How much of the work that has been support, that they supported you uh, in multiple ways, at least in the osteopathic uh, colleges, how much of the, has there been follow-up to ensure that reasonable, I think logical conclusions from such work is carried out to make sure that the environment in a in an environment in a medical school is structured to support students uh, and and to uh, you know squash this horrendous epidemic that you're describing. Very relevant question, and I wish I had a very positive response to that. Um, like I said, AAMC, but that was a big step for a medical education when AAMC stepped forward and said we will start this initiative to start assessing the prevalence and putting out some guidelines. But that, has, that, is, that, is, that is pretty much what they have done thus far. That was 2019 or 2018 or 2019, they stepped forward, right? Since then, they do have this initiative. Uh, they do have a little blurb on their website. Uh, they do encourage all medical uh, schools to follow suit. And you, you also heard about Title IX uh, directors, every medical institution. So some positive changes have come out, but not to the extent that you would have thought it would have. Um, medical schools are sitting up. They are taking, act, they are taking note. Uh, but given the enormity of what's happening in our schools and in our medical profession, the work that has come out thus far has been very minimal compared to the enormity. Uh, AMC definitely did the right thing. As you mentioned, COCA, which is the accreditation agency for osteopathic medical schools, has not yet included it in, in their radar. It's not in their radar as yet. They are not 
uh, scrutinizing medical schools for doing the right thing. Uh, they're not checking on them periodic periodically. That has not yet happened. I'm hoping all this information that is coming out, again, keep in mind, anything that hits Hollywood hits the national media, it hits social media, everyone sits up. Uh, with what happened on the West Coast, especially with all the big financial numbers, the big uh, dollar numbers, people have started taking uh, paying attention. Uh, to, to, to summarize my response, not much has happened. Still, the, the, we do absolutely need rules and regulations. We need uh, a continuous progress, a process. We need someone to look at this process every year, like COCA comes in and looks at all these standards. This should be one of the standards. So That's it's not a standard. No. It's not a standard of COCA. Is it a standard? I, I was confused on that for the LC3 schools. Are they are no. are they looking are they tying it to accreditation? No, not yet. See, that's that's the time change will take place. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Um, so thank you very much for this uh, very thorough survey. Um, I didn't really plan to talk today, but after I saw it, I remembered I was involved in an employee attitude survey, many of them for years and years. And they always said they wanted more money. They always said they didn't have enough money. And then we needed to reframe the question. And then the question was, well, what motivates you to want to do a good job? Because everyone would say they want more money. And so when I hear this, I, I wanted to ask, do you have some kind of guideline in place to make sure People don't, yeah, I've been harassed because a lot of the women I've worked with in business over the years and men both, uh, you know, they try to get involved with someone that doesn't work, they're hurt. And so they say that they were harassed and there's a very large percent and they hurt all the ones that really were, that really did yeah. suffer. They ruined the numbers. So my question was, do you have anything in place to make sure you're not getting Yes is yes is yes is just like yeah we want more money yes we were harassed yes uh, do you have something to keep to keep that in a a context that's a little bit more believable because these numbers seem so high to me and it uh, maybe I'm wrong but they just seemed high and I I don't want it diluted by people that are gaming the system so to speak or the questionnaire. No, that's a very good question that you uh, bring to the table. And unfortunately, I don't have any numbers. So with our study, uh, that did not play an important role money because these were students, number one. And uh, uh, number two, it was completely anonymous. We made that very clear at the beginning of the survey itself that the, 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 their identity would be anonymous, the schools, their association with the schools would be anonymous. So there was no such false incentive to give false numbers. So our survey was kind of clean from that perspective. Can I 100% attest to that? Of course I cannot. Maybe there was other hidden agenda. Maybe there were bad students, poor students who wanted to bring, you know, give a bad reputation to their school. I, we cannot, uh, you know, counteract those uh, measures. But looking at the data nationally and internationally, no one has looked at sexual harassment from the from the perspective that you just raised. And I don't have any answer to that. I'm sure there are bad actors who you know abuse this kind of a scenario. And as you said, they dilute out the voices of the ones who are actually being hurt. I don't have any information of that. It's a very good point to raise. Dr. Good. Yes, question, two questions. Do you have any data on other graduate schools, philosophy, engineering, and so forth? It'd be very interesting. Secondly, is I was really surprised the students were top of the list. And I think that would be very approachable in terms of the students coming in and giving them the facts and uh, uh, giving them, if well, really this is something not to be tread upon, uh, you have students to begin with. And they're the main perpetrators, which really surprised me. Yes. We were very surprised too. Uh, so to answer your first question, yes, there are there are similar there are several reports uh, looking at the incidence of uh, sexual misconduct in uh, non medical school environments like engineering or non science majors. The numbers are very very similar again and again. It is students who are the most common perpetrators. Uh, 
the incidence of non-reporters is more or less, it parallels what we found in our survey. So our survey reflected pretty much what was happening in other institutions, both globally and within the US and of course, globally too. Uh, I'm sorry, what was your second question? The students, that they are approachable, ah, they, they right, come right, under right. you and you can really lecture them and, and, and deal with them preventatively, I would think. See, that's the thing, uh, what, what I mentioned earlier on in my, uh, towards the end, uh, again, I'm not pointing to any particular medical school, but the general rule is students get one sexual uh, misconduct training, sexual abuse training at the start of medical school. And that just basically gives you a few uh, scenarios, you know, vignettes where they demonstrate, uh, you know, most of them are online and they demonstrate what constitutes six sexual misconduct or, mis or misbehavior, and then they drop the ball. There is no ongoing messaging. That's number one. And number two is that that information about students being the major perpetrators, number one, having accountability, having a monitoring process, ongoing monitoring process, that information is not disseminated, unfortunately. If that was done very much early in the start of the education about holding people accountable, monitoring it periodically, having these uh, seminars on a regular basis, I'm sure the culture would change very quickly. And that's Thank one you. of the things that I'm doing with my students, uh, the research project, we are hoping to bring forth these uh, uh, in-person modules where we want students engaged in it. It's a very exciting project. We want, again, keep in mind, I can talk till I'm blue in my face. <laughs> it's when students talk, that's when the message really hits. So we, this is all student uh, run projects. Very exciting. I'm hope, hoping to bring that back sometime soon. Fascinating. Did, uh, is there anybody else that has any questions before we go? It's a little bit over nine o'clock, but perhaps one more question to end it. I do have one question if there isn't <laughs> any others. I um, need to just, so Mike, Mike, I just need to drop by your office. We can chat for a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, we could do that. Uh, but do you have time for one more? Just real quick. Yes, of course. Okay. So uh, uh, often, right, it is said, uh, at least with my understanding, and, and I think it makes sense, that, right, sexual harassment, abuse is not about sexuality. It's about power. Uh, and, and I've often heard that makes sense to me, but I've, I, I realized that, of course, physicians are in a very powerful place. They're put in a very powerful place. Is there anything on that side of things? In other words, to, to look at the way students, faculty, staff, et cetera, are looking at their use of power and their relationship to it and the relationship of uh, to leadership positions that they have. Um, in the context of this, I, I, in other words, is there anything that they that we could do on the other side of things, not just reporting, but actually getting to the root causes as to why this bad behavior is being perpetrated? I think it all comes down to education and awareness, ongoing education awareness. That's number one, and number mm -hmm. two is holding and holding people accountable. Only when you hold people accountable, that's the only time culture is going to change. Yeah. Okay. There is no other way. So, for, and, and, then, and then money. So when you're looking at hospitals, uh, let's say like USC or UCLA, any one of them, then they have to shell out $1.1 billion. They're going to make some changes. Interesting. Money talks. Well, thank you so much. And yes, let's come you. by the office and we'll talk more. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thank you so Everybody much. Everybody have again. a wonderful have a day, day or everyone. evening, uh, wherever you may be. Enjoy the rest of your, your day. Or evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>